So now it comes to this, Aimika. You think to steal my golden dream, but I will not allow it to happen. My gratitude is yours for disabling the storms. It seems I did not require Rivan's ship to reach Yukaiso in the end. Not on your soul. I have waited for this casita for far too long. Until the next life? Nor perhaps not, considering. I see trouble. You descend into the ancient winding streets of Ukaizo. Battered by storms for thousands of years, the ruins bear the marks of their role as the lone witnesses of the god's great secret at the center of the city. The houses and boulevards are pierced by great spears of luminous Audra. There are no ashen bodies, no birds, no sign or sound of any life. But with every step, the rhythmic pounding in the distance draws nearer. Soon, you can feel the vibration traveling up your spine. As you approach the center of the city, the weathered architecture gives way to more luminous Audra piercing the ruins, eventually overtaking them entirely. Cresting the top of a fallen tower, you finally get a clear view of Aethys. He stands, legs astride, next to a great stone monument ringed with 11 cavernous alcoves. All but three hold a gargantuan skeleton, bones scrubbed clean by the city's storms. An immense anguithin machine floats above the monument, suspended by invisible energy emanating from a well of light beneath it. Great brass rings spin around a core of metal and Audra at the machine's center. Periodically, Aethys' massive arms swing back. The movement alone is enough to draw great gusts of wind toward him. When they come down on the machine, the impacts are accompanied by eruptions of electricity, fire, and smoke. The hundreds of luminous Audra pillars across Ukaizo sympathetically dim in a rippling wave that spreads out from the machine. The only safe route to the god is a steep ascent along a monstrous pillar of luminous Audra, intertwined with fragments of Ukaizo's ruins that it has carried through the centuries. The pillar bends in a long arc, towering above the machine. The pillar levels out near Aethys' head, a silent observer to the destruction of the machine it has grown beside over thousands of years. 
You weave your way along a treacherous rain-slicked path up the pillar's skyward side. As you arrive at the top, you catch Aethys's attention. Fist pulled back, he pauses to observe you. With the same gentleness he showed at Ashen Ma, he lowers his arm and turns toward you. this way. It may be hard to picture, but this city was once full of life. The Huana, yes, but also kith from many other cultures. Great hanging trees shadowed these boulevards. Gardens sprawled across the open rooftops. Each spring, a festival procession would wind its way from the hillside into this valley, the celebrants would pass through a steep walk among the stalls of foreign merchants, flowers falling upon them from all sides. All people of all nations, together in a celebration of new life. Such was the power and beauty of Lost Ukaizo. If we don't fix this mess you're about to cause, the whole world is going to look this bad. I mean, it's a mighty heavy load you're putting on our shoulders. I just hope we can carry it. As long as there are people like you in this world, Adair, I truly do. This power has always been in the grasp of mortals. Now you will finally be aware of it. Now you will be able to decide what to do with it. Gone, please. I'm begging you. What do I do following this? Help. How am I to best serve those still living, to improve our future chances of survival? The Deadfire and the Eastern Reach are full of Animancers, women and men with brilliant minds who can solve this great problem. They will also need people with brilliant souls, like you, Shodi. People who can tend to the spiritual needs of the world in a time of fear and desperation. Remember, the flame you bear is not only light, but warmth. Provide comfort to all who need it. What right do you have to do this? Destroy the wheel and leave us with nothing? Without even knowing what will come next? Aloth, we are all gods and mortals, responsible for our own actions. But inaction carries its own moral responsibility. It is a burden I have carried for far too long. One must always do as their conscience dictates, even if that means abdicating a position of power. But what of you, Watcher? Why have you followed me? Have you come to bear witness to the breaking of the wheel? And you believe I should give my strength to one of them? I am certain Woodica has convinced you of this course. Why do you believe I should give this power, which we have used so irresponsibly for so long, to any of them?
It is true. We created ourselves as equals, even if Wurdeka did create a story about her past to elevate her own glory. You have convinced me, Watcher. The gods do need a strong leader. I will ensure they have one after I am gone. Indulge me in a moment's curiosity. There is something I wish to know about Aeora, about Kith, that I can only learn through your eyes. You followed me all this way, dodging an armada, navigating an impenetrable wall of storms, voyaging across uncharted seas, besting a guardian who existed to bar your trespass, with the machinations of gods echoing in your ears. And you did so on your own. That is no small achievement. Kith across Aora will hear the tale of it, and look to you with awe. I believe that mortals possess the strength to collaborate and shape a future of their own design. Not all of my brothers and sisters agree. I had hoped your actions would set an example for the future. Demonstrating the resilience and ingenuity of mortals when they work together. Coming to Okaizo unencumbered by alliances proves a different point than the one I intended but it is a valuable one, all the same. What inspired your decision, Watcher? Did the choice echo your foundational beliefs? Or were you influenced by observation? I thank you for your perspective. Yours is not the only opinion that concerns me. But for the moment, all I ever wanted for mortals was growth, transformation. Some have forgotten themselves, giving in to fatalism or tyranny. Others have succumbed to apathy. It brings me great sorrow that crisis is the only way to set the future in motion. Would that I could pass the responsibility of heralding your darkest hour to another. You shirked the aid of others and came this far alone. But I think you'll find that the future is built on trust, cooperation, and understanding among Kith. I must attend to my final work now. I cannot del- You have carried a heavy burden. You are free now. Many will come to you. I have great hope for you. Aethys squares himself to the machine. As you move to a safe distance, he, he returns to his task, each strike bringing with it the sound of cracking stone and twisting metal, the flickering of luminous Audra across Ukaizo. As the ancient machine finally begins to succumb to his strength, so too does Aethys's body, built to withstand the passage of thousands of years. Cracks appear along the hands, then race up the arms. Aethys does not slow his assault, but continues unabated. Its brass rings twisted. The machine spins erratically, but withstands the relentless barrage. Aethys stands astride it and pummels the base of the machine. Soul energy begins to flare out from the machine's heart, warping the air with the intense. You see Aethys's arm. As Aethys's voice fades, the enormity of what you've accomplished sinks in. You have confronted a god. You have rediscovered the ancient city where the wheel was forged, and you have seen the wheel shattered. What comes next is uncertain. But already the legend spreads of the Watcher, who survived Andra's mortar and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Aethys. Aethys channels his essence into Barith, empowering the god of doors, cycles, 
and life and death beyond all other gods. Barith vows to maintain peace and order in the here and the beyond, while Kith labor toward a solution. The other gods, for the time being, submit. Under Barith's guidance, the world becomes a more predictable, stable place. Seasons fall into a disturbingly regular rhythm, and wars, famines, and natural disasters dwindle. But so too do surges of prosperity and innovation. Great minds around the world work methodically towards salvation, both unhindered and uninspired by changes, upheavals, and the unexpected. In reaching Ukaizo and facing Aethys, you have accomplished the impossible, and you have done it without the assistance of the great powers of Deadfire. Your feats capture the awe and imagination of a world that needs heroes more than ever. Some say your intervention prevented Aethys from a far worse act of destruction. Many believe you will be the salvation of Aeora. With each day, your legend grows, as does the chaos in Deadfire. Ukaizo remains unclaimed, and the Afekia Channel becomes the site of a near constant battle as the Juana and the Rawataians vie for control of the unprotected island. The Rawataians rely on their cannons, and the Juana call forth massive waves and beasts of the deep to sink their foes. And while they chip away at one another, the Valians and the Principi pursue their own ends with increasing abandon. Emboldened by their rival's distraction, the Valian Trading Company seizes territory and mines Luminous Audra at a startling pace. Juana villages are left at the mercy of unscrupulous speculators, and resource-rich islands are swarmed and stripped. To support their operations, the Valian Trading Company begins shipping ever greater quantities of supplies and Luminous Audra to and from the archipelago. This attracts the attention of the Principi, who target these ships with increasing aggression. The promise of fat prizes draws even more pirates to their ranks. The Rawataians, as well as the Juana, are too busy to stop them. The mysterious deaths of Governor Clario and Storm Speaker Ikawa provoke hostilities between the Valian settlers and the Huawan residents. But by the time anyone bothers to question the strange coincidences surrounding their deaths, including reports of a cloaked Omawi woman seen in both the port and the village. Both sides have gone too far to turn back. As the balance of power changes in Deadfire, so too does Nekataka transform. With the major powers at one another's throats, Nekataka becomes a maelstrom of chaos. Spies and smugglers follow the flow of refugees into the city, where violence is commonplace. Ukaizo remains the coveted prize, and Nekitaka fades into an afterthought. Largely forgotten amidst more prominent concerns, the gullet continues to be a miserable place, especially for those Raparu who flee to Nekitaka seeking a haven amidst the turmoil. For them, the Grand City is a promise cruelly broken. With Skiarelifus's essence still empowering the Water Shapers Guild, the practice of water shaping grows and flourishes in Nekataka, and its practitioners rise in prestige. They install conveyors in the falls that run through the city and craft sculptures for every street and plaza. Thus, the Water Shapers Guild becomes a power in its own right in the city of Nekataka. Your brief encounter with Letharn proves deeply influential for the children of the Dawn Stars. He comes to recognize his nightmares and the scene at Hisongo as Aethys' final warning to his people. Unite in strength and faith, or perish forever. As word of Aethys' deeds at Ukaizo spreads, his fellow Dawn Stars take this message to heart. As Aethys pours his essence into Bereth, so too do the children of the Dawn Stars pour their faith into the god of doors and cycles, life and death. Some pray for guidance and order. Others take it upon themselves to enforce it. They sharpen their scythes and sickles to defend the peace they have been granted. They failed Aethys before. They will not fail Bareth now. Ruanu, the chieftain of the Juana at Tikawara, died.
dies mysteriously. The tribe finds his body washed up on the same beach where Anaharu challenged him to the trial of waves. Some blame Anaharu's vengeful spirit. Others see it as Ngati's final judgment. And a few speak of a strange man seen lingering in the village. The leaderless tribe eventually scatters. Some head to Negataka, while others seek out the Wahaki. The dragon, Nereskirlas, no longer passes between Aeora and the White Void, and the dead flow slowly breaks apart, exposing the temple long frozen within. Vatnir tries to hold the Harbingers of Dusk together, and for a time, succeeds. The group resettles within and around the temple, vowing to protect it. Eventually, however, Remergon's godlike falters, and his followers sacrifice him to the White Void. The temple of Remergon falls into disrepair, home only to madmen and monsters. In besting the Beast of Winter, you earned the Death God's mercy rather than his enmity. The deity remains characteristically unforthcoming about his decision, and you're left to wonder whether in doing battle with him in the White Void, you somehow furthered his apocalyptic ambitions. Once repaired, the Adra at the primal island of Kazuwari again pulses with the flow of soul essence between the here and the beyond. The feral life on the island flourishes, the jungles and veld growing ever wilder and resistant to settlement and exploration alike. The faces of the hunt continue to rule the Crucible and Galloways, or rather, Tawamawai's name. The trials summoned by the statue grow deadlier with each season, until only those rare few willing to brave the gravest of dangers seek out the bloody ordeals of Kazuwari. Like the other souls following in your wake, Muatu eventually yearns to move on to the beyond and the wheel. Stymied by Aethys's actions, however, he settles on returning to Kazuwari, where he joins the choir of souls that echo throughout the Crucible. Slain by your hand, the Titan of Wal poses little further threat to Aeora. As the corpse decays, it putrefies into a massive nest of hungry fungal monstrosities. Vessels that anchor off the shores of the Black Isles tend to go missing, only to turn up shipwrecked months or even years later against distant shores. With time, the body collapses upon itself, and the Black Isles finally implode. Though your adventures alter the destiny of Aeora and the balance of power in Deadfire, they also leave a lasting mark on those who travel at your side. Your companions find themselves changed in ways both big and small. Adair returns to Hisongo, where he reunites with Burn, the son of his former lover, Elava. Although Burn regrets not having joined the army of Aethys, he accepts that he tried to go about it the wrong way. Likewise, he comes to idolize his new uncle, who has truly marched in the lighted path. Together they set about bolstering Aethys' following in Deadfire, and prepare for the greater conflict Adair believes is soon to come. Shodi is not a priestess who understands the meaning of subtlety. As such, she makes her girlish crush on Adair painfully obvious from the moment she first sets eyes on the strapping fighter. Early in your travels, Adair appears discomforted by her persistent flirting. He often grimaces when she sidles up to him, and he takes endless pains to keep their conversations terse and to the point. But after a little smoothing on your part to nudge them in the right direction, Adair makes an effort to view Shodi with an open mind. And Shodi begins teasing the veteran fighter in a more companionable and less amorous manner. After saving each other's hides a couple times and sharing more than a few laughs, the two form an easy, and you suspect, lifelong friendship. Seemingly lit with an inner glow, Shodi takes to a new life of mission work with Gusto. 
She still is committed to shepherding souls for God, but having realigned her goals with that of her fellow Dawn Stars, she now endeavors to help the living as much as the dead. As you travel the dead fire, you find her sleeping better and laughing more often. When the time comes for her to return to her temple in Nekataka, it's with a clear wistfulness and much lip biting on her part. She leaves you with her sickle and a hastily scrawled note. It reads, A keepsake from a path once walked. Remember me, Watcher, for I will forever dream of you. Aloth renews his commitment to destroying the Leaden Key. With the wheel broken, loosening the god's stranglehold on Kith is more urgent than ever. It is a lofty goal, and one he does not expect to finish in his lifetime. But if there's one thing he's learned from the Watcher, it's that a single person can change the world. You let Romaro go, and the former pirate ostensibly set sail for the trade lanes of the Eastern Reach, the Edir Empire, Old Valia, and the Republics. For the remainder of your time together, Seraphin seems, if not exactly happy, at least contented with the outcome of your confrontation with his former mentor at Sayuka. When he leaves, he does so with little fanfare. Nothing but a roughly scrawled note slipped under your door. Be seeing you, Cap. You hear of Seraphin from time to time, in rumors and sea tales. He prowls the dead fire, a brutally efficient killer, never long for any ship and never close to any crew. The Valian Trading Company is initially furious when they learn that Palagina had assisted the Watcher in claiming Ukaizo. In the chaotic aftermath, the company takes a more nuanced view of Palagina's actions. The turmoil in the region allows the well-organized company to seize a number of valuable assets from their competitors. Though Palagina is not rewarded for her actions, nor is she punished, the Dukes and Songretta agree to forget her support of the Watcher. She is quietly reassigned to duty in the Valian Republics, an order she gladly obeys. Despite her good fortunes in the Deadfire, Palagina mourns the loss of Jackalo for years. She curses herself for not finding her friend sooner, for not protecting him from Captain Tutzadl and his crew. On a few lonely nights, Palagina composes letters to the Watcher, asking what more they could have done to save him. They are never sent. Time away from the Navy gives Maya Rua some perspective on how Rawatai conducted the Deadfire occupation. No sooner does she return to active duty than she voices her frustrations over some of the more underhanded tactics she witnessed and carried out in the name of the homeland. Her voice carries all the way to the Ranganui, who reminds his admirals that battles are won by superior tactics, but war is a battle of precedent, and winning is not always a victory. The people listen. Though Mayo's covert assignment in the dead fire is considered a success, few claim knowledge of it or openly congratulate her. She receives no praise beyond knowing glances or the occasional raised tankard from her countrymen. She never responds. There's never enough free time to explore your mutual connection. Something about your bond feels unfinished. But as your paths diverge, you start running out of reasons to see each other. In your presence, she's always armed with a pleasant smile and lots of questions. Her embrace is full of warmth. If there isn't time now, someday there might be. She looks forward to seeing her brother again. So does Ashiza. Takehu distances himself from the problems of the dead fire, giving the tribes a reprieve from godlike omens. And Gati's silence speaks volumes. The Juana grow to rely on each other, paving a new way forward divorced from their traditions. Soon after he departs Nekataka, Distant tribes report of unusual and salacious water sculptures appearing on the shores. These quaint visitations are widely celebrated. The identity of the artist 
ever an open question. He bids you farewell, suggesting that you seek your next adventure in a brothel or tavern, where consequences begin and end at the front door. He sounds eager to leave old conflicts in the past. Your pursuit of Aethys and your journey to Ukaizo signal the end of forces that have shaped the lives of Kith and the course of nations. The cycle of reincarnation has been broken. The storms of Andra's mortar have calmed. Yet each ending promises a new beginning. As the sun rises over Ukaizo, Kith turn their gaze eastward wondering at what lies beyond, and at the world they will fashion for themselves. As the Watcher of Cadnua and the former Herald of Bareth, you return to your ship and begin the long journey home. You hope for calm weather. <laughs>